Hi guys and welcome to the second lecture for chapter 4. Today we'll be going over trophic interactions, food webs, food chains, and trophic cascades. So when we look at uh, trophic levels, it's useful to have a conceptual tool in order to kind of con to picture it. And that's what a food chain is for. A food chain is basically a linear network of links in an ecosystem, starting from producer organisms and working all the way up to apex predator species. And when you think of food chains, know that it's not a realistic depiction of what's actually happening in an ecosystem. They're really useful conce conceptual tools for you to understand how uh, matter and energy work their way up from uh, the producer level all the way up to the apex predator level. However, in reality, most uh, ecosystems don't have a linear chain. It's very, very uh, non-linear, and we'll go over a food web, which takes into account those, uh, those non-linear interactions uh, later on. But for now, a food chain is a Again, a linear transfer in matter and energy. And when we think of trophic levels, trophic levels refer to several, uh, one of several hierarchical levels in a ecosystem food chain. Uh, each level is comprised of organisms that share things like the same niche or the same function within that food chain, the same nutritional relationship to primary organisms in terms of energy. And there are and there are many different uh, trophic levels within a food chain. It starts with uh, producers, the autotrophs that uh, produce our own food from the sunlight, so think plants or algae and uh, other organisms like that. Moving then to primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary or final consumers, and then detritivores and decomposers. And we're going to break down each one of those trophic levels here in the next couple of slides. And when we start with any food chain, the base is always going to be producers. Producers are organisms which produce their own food. They're also known as autotrophs, and the vast majority of them use sunlight, uh, carbon dioxide, and water in order to take in energy and then convert that energy and that mass or matter into sugars as well as biomass. Uh, and they, again, they form the base of just about every ecosystem food chain on the planet. There are some ecosystem food chains at the bottom of the oceans which rely on chemo synthesis instead of photosynthesis. That's something a little bit different, but we're never going to go into that just because that's such a rare uh, exception. Um, and so examples of producers are going to be things like plants, algae, as well as cyanobacteria, anything that has chlorophyll and anything that photosynthesizes to produce its own food. After our producers, we then move up one rung on our food chain and we reach our primary consumer. Primary consumers are organisms that eat producers. They're also going to be known as herbivores and they form the second level of any ecosystem food chain. Examples of herbivores are going to be like your grasshopper up in the top right and right corner of your screen, or they can be large mammals such as your billy goat, which, are on the, which is on the bottom of your screen. Moving another rung up on our ecosystem food chain, we then reach our secondary consumer. And secondary consumers are basically organisms that eat primary consumers. And so these are going to be your uh, smaller predators. This is again going to be the third level of your ecosystem food chain. And examples of secondary consumers are going to be organisms that try normally eat primary consumers. So usually insects are going to be your uh, primary consumers in most uh, complex ecosystems. And so secondary consumers are most often going to be uh, animals or organisms which eat insects. So you could have a frog eating a cricket down here, you can have a dragonfly eating uh, some kind of fly, or you can have a bird on the right hand side of your screen which likes to eat this nice, I think that's either a caterpillar or a worm. Either way, all of these organisms are going to be uh, secondary consumers. Moving forward, we then move to our tertiary consumer. And tertiary consumers are organisms which eat secondary consumers. So these are going to be getting into some of your larger predators. These are going Going to be either the top uh, of your food chain or they're going to be near the top of your ecosystem food chain. So these are going to be some pretty uh, pretty intense guys. So examples of uh, tertiary consumers are going to be things like snakes, which here is eating a, uh, an alligator. You can have hawks, which eat the birds, which eat insects, or you can have a uh, like a great white shark, which is about to chow down on the seal over here. Uh, and then finally, when we get into our the top rung of our ecosystem food chain, we then reach our final consumer. And final consumers are simply the apex predator. These are going to be predators at the top of any given food chain or food web. 
And so, but what I want to get across here is that not all ecosystems have a tertiary consumer. Sometimes the final consumer is a secondary consumer, or sometimes the final consumer is actually just your primary consumer. For example, wolves are a great example of an apex predator, and wolves are not a tertiary consumer. They're a secondary consumer. They eat deer, which eat grass. So uh, and another example is a lion. No one would uh, consider a lion not to be an apex predator. However, lions are also technically a, uh, a secondary consumer. Now, great uh, killer whales are definitely a tertiary or final consumer. They are several rungs up that ladder because killer whales actually can eat great white sharks. So there are a final consumer is just the last consumer in your uh, ecosystem food chain. It doesn't necessarily have to be a secondary consumer, a tertiary consumer, or something above a tertiary consumer. They can be as long as they are the last uh, predator on that rung. They are an apex predator and they are a final consumer. And then uh, when we get to the, after we get to our final predator, our apex predator, eventually your apex predator is going to die, just like any other organism on this uh, food chain. And that's where we get to our recycling uh, stage. This is going to be your detritivores and your uh, decomposers. And, and so recycling organisms are going to be organisms which recycle used matter, decaying, uh, decaying uh, organic matter, as well as nutrients so that they can recycle this matter for for producers to readily reaccess. Remember in chapter two that I said like 15 billion times, matter is recycled in ecosystems and energy flows through ecosystems. So this and this matter, because it remains in the uh, the ecosystem because they can't get any more of it, that matter needs to be broken down into its base nutrients so it can be recompiled into our producing organisms. This is where our decomposers and our detritivores come in. Uh, our detritivores are going to be organisms that feed and break down dead plants and uh, dead animal matter. These are going to be things like millipedes, soil insects, and uh, occasionally ants. And then a decomposer is going to be organisms that break down leaf litter as well as other non-living components. These are going to be things like fungi, which you see on the right-hand side of your screen, and different types of bacteria. Now, detritivores and decomposers are uh, both going to be recycling organisms, but they're, they have very nuanced definitions. Uh, so I definitely would like you to know uh, that decomposers and detritivores break down nutrients and recycle it in the food chain. However, I'm not going to ask you guys a question on which one is which. I did that in the past and realized that they were just way too similar um, for it to be fair to ask a nuanced question about the definitions of either one of those. So know what they are. Don't necessarily feel the need to be able to distinguish between one or another on exam. On an exam, I'm not going to, to ask you anything about that. And so now that we've talked about our uh, food chain, it's useful to really see what, how an ecosystem functions by looking at a food web. Remember how I was just saying that while a food chain is a nice conceptual tool, it's not very accurate because most interactions within a community or in, a, in any ecosystem are not really going to be linear. In reality, they're going to be like apex predators will eat primary and secondary consumers. Like a hawk will eat a snake and a rodent or a hawk will eat a bug, a snake and a rodent. They will, pr predators will predate on organisms at multiple levels in that ecosystem. And so food webs are a conceptual model of trophic level interactions which show far more complex relationships and transfers of matter and energy. And it's a little more accurate. So if you look down here on the bottom right hand side of your screen, you get a an example of a marine food web which starts with algae, the marine organisms uh, primary producers, and works all the way up to our killer whale and our blue whale, which are going to be the at the very top of the food chain. And food webs are are, uh, a little a lot more accurate as well as displaying a lot of ecosystem uh, complexity and it allows you to really see how uh, how many moving parts these uh, some of these ecosystems have in them and again, when we talked about chapter two, we were talking about how matter and energy uh, flow through ecosystems. Energy in a one-way stream, matter flowing through in a cyclical cycle over and over again. And when we look at different rungs in our food web or our food chain, each trophic level only transfers about 10% of its matter and energy into the level above it. So a lot of this uh, matter and energy gets used and spent. And anyway, this, uh, this rule that only 10% uh, 
is makes it to the next level is known as the 10% rule. And a lot of you might be asking, well, what happens to all the, the other 90% of matter and energy at each one of these trophic levels? And what happens is a lot of organisms just burn it off. Uh, remember that you don't incorporate every um, bit of matter that you eat, you, everyone poops. And so that's a great example of how we only really capitalize on about 10% of what we eat. The rest of it just goes right out of us. In addition, we also are using a lot of that energy for our own daily functions. We're constantly uh, burning energy in order to walk, talk, think, etc. So we're not just just storing all of the energy that we eat. Um, most of it is actually burned off almost immediately. And so uh, as a result, only about 10% of biomass and matter actually makes it to the next trophic level. And so if we have 100 kilograms of producers, 100 kilograms of, um, of plants, we're only, going to be able, we're only going to be able to sustain 10 kilograms of our, uh, of our primary consumers. Out of that 10 kilograms of primary consumers, only one kilogram will only be able to support about one kilogram of secondary consumers and 0.1 kilograms of tertiary consumers Etc. So as a result, because of this 10% rule, and I need you to keep this in mind, producers by necessity have to have the largest number of individuals and the largest number of biomass in any ecosystem. They are the foundation of that pyramid, and because of the 10% rule, if they don't have a very high amount of biomass, it, the, that ecosystem cannot support anything above it. Uh, as a result, again, because of that 10% uh, that rule, tertiary consumers or apex predators are going to have the lowest amount of individuals and the lowest amount of biomass in that level. And again, this is what has to happen just based on the mathematics behind any given ecosystem. Now, when we look at the niches or the niches of, a, of different organisms or different species within an ecosystem, not all niches are going to be created equal. Some organisms have a disproportionate influence on the structure and functioning of ecosystems, whereas others don't really play such an integral role. And a keystone species refers to species which exert disproportionate amounts of influence on the structure and functioning of a given ecosystem. Basically, if we remove this keystone species from its component ecosystem, that uh, ecosystem normally disintegrates or completely falls apart just because that organism's role was so important for the functioning of that ecosystem. Now, because of the influence of predator-prey uh, predator dynamics and the influence of predators on organisms below them uh, when we look down a food chain, usually a final consumer is going to be our keystone species in most ecosystems due to uh, its ability to disproportionately control the abundances of secondary and primary consumers. Because uh, keystone species uh, feed and control the numbers of organisms on rungs of that uh, food web below it, it has a huge amount of influence on the functioning of that ecosystem. So examples of keystone species are going to be wolves. That's kind of the trademark keystone species that everyone likes to talk about. In addition, uh, otters are also a great example of a keystone species. And sea stars, um, basically starfish, are another example of a keystone sea species because starfish can eat so many different kinds of organisms that need to be kept under control. Starfish also do a really great job of keeping ecosystems in check. But how does this actually keep an ecosystem in control? Why are these apex predators so important in the functioning of these ecosystems? And for that, we really need to get into something called a trophic cascade. Now, a trophic cascade refers to top-down, meaning the top of the food web down, control of higher trophic levels on lower trophic levels. So when we look at the role of an apex predator, it's, we're going to be looking at the role of that apex predator on secondary consumers, primary consumers, and ultimately producers. Basically, producers control the abundances of primary consumers and uh, secondary consumer populations. And primary consumers uh, essentially control producer populations. Basically, uh, apex predators control the abundances of their prey, and pr those prey organisms control the abundances of the plants that they eat. So you see how each ladder of this food web controls the abundances of the organisms below it, but the influence of a, an apex predator maintains the balance of the entire ecosystem, and this is because of the non-indirect interactions of apex predators on producers. Say that a, so say that otters like to eat sea urchins. 
um, sea urchins are a common grazer in a kelp ecosystem, and otters control the abundances of the second of these primary consumers, sea urchins. Sea urchins, in turn, control the abundances of kelp. Because sea urchins eat kelp, they control how much kelp is allowed to persist in the ecosystem. Now, if a if a sea otter is removed from that ecosystem, all of a sudden there is nothing controlling the abundances of sea urchins. Sea urchins, as a result, explode in growth because there's nothing uh, there's nothing eating them anymore. And because sea urchins explode in growth, they then in turn eat all of the kelp uh, the kelp ecoforest. They eat all of the kelp in that ecosystem, and the entire ecosystem begins to fall apart because the habitat that was provided by those kelp forests are no longer apparent. Organisms leave. The sea urchins have, that have now exploded in growth die off because there's no food left, and the entire ecosystem collapses. So by indirectly, but so when otters control the secondary or primary consumers below them, sea urchins or some kind of fish, they indirectly control the abundances of producers. And as a result, when we remove that apex predator, the entire ecosystem begins to fall apart because that top-down control, that trophic cascade, no longer is functioning the way it's supposed to. And so again, just diving into some of the nuances of the trophic cascade and what happens when that is no longer facilitated. When we look at Yellowstone Park, for example, Yellowstone managed to eradicate their wolves in the early 20th century. What happened was an explosion of their pre prey species, deer, which then ate all of the vegetation in Yellowstone Park, or a vast majority of the vegetation in Yellowstone Park. And it actually created a lot of indirect problems with species that weren't actually related to wolves or deer just because of the inavailability of some of these primary producers and some of the problems that were associated with it. However, when wolves were reintroduced into the late in the late 20th century, a lot of things that had been forgotten, a lot of these indirect impacts in the ecosystem were beginning to be refacilitated again. And as a result, the ecosystem actually got really healthy. Beavers moved back into the area. A large amount of vegetation was somehow reintroduced now that it wasn't being overgrazed. And a lot of ecosystem services now came back. So even if an apex predator or a keystone species has been removed from an ecosystem, when that organism is reintroduced into that uh, ecosystem, that ecosystem can begin to restructure itself all over again. Now this is everything that we have for trophic interactions and keystone species. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Next we will be moving on to something known as succession. I'll see you guys then.